Welcome to the Pro-Life Team Podcast. My name is Jacob Barr, and in this episode, we're sharing footage captured for the Abortion Museum. Oh, I'm Byron Calhoun. I'm a maternal fetal medicine, which is high-risk obstetrics, and I have about 30 years in both obstetrics and gynecology and also high-risk obstetrics. Uh, I am also a diplomat of the American board. I am board certified, as I pointed out. Um, have been doing this, like I said, for about 30 years. And I'm a professor and vice chair at West Virginia University, so I teach medical students and residents and I'm involved in patient care virtually every day. So active practice. Awesome. So when does new, li uh, new human life begin? Well, I'm going to preface a little bit. If I go off into the fetus and embryo, which we'll talk a little bit about some of those distinctions versus baby, I always consider it is a baby. But uh, if you look at what we talk about in terms of life beginning, embryologically, scientifically, it begins at the moment the egg and the sperm meet in conception. Uh, you become a complete new member of uh, Homo sapiens, a, a new human being, if you will. Uh, Byron, can you make sure you're uh, looking at the camera? That camera? Yes. Got it. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're okay, though. That's fine. Yeah. Um, what, does, what, so, sorry, um, what words do medical professionals typically use to describe whatever it is that's inside the pregnant mother? What exactly that gets aborted? The scientific uh, definition of the of the, uh, the the baby essentially is is an embryo below 12 weeks, and after uh, 12 weeks to 13 weeks, then it becomes the fetus. Uh, when you look at an, a performance of abortion, you're looking at the uh, abortion or the uh, taking the life of a human being or a baby with the placenta and the membranes. Perfect. Um, question three. Please share about some of the development milestones as that tiny human grows from a single cell all the way to a fully formed baby at birth. For example, when is there a detectable heartbeat, fingernails, brain waves, pain sensations, and dreaming? If you look at the way uh, you've described the different things we've talked about, fetal heart rate generally is detectable by ultrasound between five and six weeks gestation. Uh, which is from last menstrual period, which is actually really more like three to four weeks if you look at uh, from time of, of conception. Fingernails start forming at about 11 weeks and are fully formed by probably 19 or 20 weeks. There have been reports of brain waves being present as early as five to six weeks uh, after uh, LMP. Uh, pain is debatable, but certainly the development of the fetus or the baby is uh, complete enough to where pain should be feel, felt at approximately 15 weeks. Dreaming is one of those things that everybody argues about. It's probably as early as 20 to 22 weeks. We think that the baby's uh, frontal cortex is developed enough to get the actual dreams, and then you start seeing baby eye movements like REM sleep. Makes sense. Uh, question four. Some people may not realize that in the medical world, the word abortion has a wider scope of meaning than what we see in, a political, than in political debates on this topic. Would you clarify what is natural abortion, spontaneous abortion, and missed abortion? The, the definition narrowly of an abortion is any pregnancy that's delivered or uh, terminated before 20 weeks. So everything 20 weeks and below is considered an abortion. Uh, if you look at the definition of a natural abortion, that would be similar to a spontaneous abortion. That would be one that was completed without surgery or without any medication. If you look at, again, the spontaneous, that's simply one that passes naturally without any intervention. The idea of a missed abortion is where you find a loss of a baby or a fetus or embryo or fetus, if you will, uh, before 20 weeks without any symptoms. The, the, the patient or the mother would come in and would just find absent heart tones, and that would be called a missed abortion because the mother doesn't uh, have any idea that she's having a, a loss of her pregnancy. Makes sense. What is therapeutic abortion and what is elective abortion? If you look at the term therapeutic, that is allegedly an abortion that's done uh, less than 20 weeks gestation for a medical condition uh, or threat to the mother's life, a, a grave threat. And that would be hemorrhage or severe high blood pressure or infection like sepsis, things that would actually interfere with the woman's ability to function or damage her. An elective abortion is simply one that's done because the patient does not want the pregnancy or the, or the baby. 
Question number six. That's a good, thank you for that de definition. Question number six. To the best of your knowledge, are there any states that have legally banned miscarriage, stillbirth, or therapeutic abortion? Uh, there are no states that I'm aware of that, that would ban any ability to deal with a miscarriage or a baby who's died in utero or stillbirth. And they all have language that I'm aware of uh, that would define what would allow you to uh, deliver a mother or do uh, an abortion below 20 weeks for a severe um, threat to the mother's life. Makes sense. Number seven, there is some disagreement about where to draw the line between elective versus therapeutic abortion. How dangerous does a pregnancy have to be before an abortion would qualify as therapeutic? Please give some examples. Uh, I think that this has been obfuscated or really blurred, but really the usual criteria that are written or that we understand medically are those that are done for the life of the mother where her life is in imminent danger or a grave harm to the mother or her functioning some way physically. Usually those are severe preeclampsia, severe high blood pressure. It would be perhaps rupture of membranes with mother with sepsis or severe infection. A critically uh, ill patient with heart disease, perhaps, uh, and the final one would be a se severe bleeding or hemorrhage would be examples. Question number eight. Some suggest that when women experience pregnancy complications, abortion typically isn't as safe as just inducing early, early delivery, perhaps offering palliative care if the child is too premature. What do you think? Is this true, Part, partly true, mostly false, or entirely false? It, w it depends on how you define the complications. I think that if you look at the literature, abortion is always more dangerous to women. If you look at maternal mortality, you look at preterm birth risks, you look at breast cancer risk and the psychological effects of abortion, it's always uh, worse for women to have abortion than it is to try to do a delivery or provide care. Uh, the idea of uh, providing uh, palliative care is actually a very interesting question has actually been looked at. There was a group at Harvard actually looked at this, looking at babies with anencephaly, which is essentially uniformly fatal. And what they found, there was a significant difference in the outcomes, especially emotionally and psychologically to the mothers who underwent palliative care or hospice care versus those who did the elective abortion procedures. Thank you for talking on that. Number nine, what are some of the health risks involved in pregnancy and childbirth? Well, the risk in pregnancy, we've talked a little bit about that, really would be preeclampsia or high blood pressure pregnancy is one of the significant uh, problems we see. We also see uh, diabetes, of course, as one of the increased risks that we see. There's postpartum hemorrhage after patients deliver as a risk to pregnancy. There are anesthetic complications uh, that may be involved in that. There's also some increased risk if you look at the, the literature for homicides and overdose and even suicide with relationship to pregnancy. Makes sense. What are some of the health benefits of the benefits involved in pregnancy and childbirth? Uh, the thing I always tell young women in particular is that there really is uh, a decreased risk of death. It improves your life immensely. There's been a study we did actually looking at a rather large Danish database of several million women and what we found was the death rates in women over their life was about half of, the, half of what it would be if you had an abortion versus live birth. We also know that there's an increased risk of breast cancer, even though that's been disputed. If you look at multiple studies, that's across all uh, ethnicities and across the whole world, there's a definitely an increased risk of breast cancer if you get pregnant and carry to term uh, less than 30 years of age. Uh, decreased risk of ovarian cancer. Uh, there's a decreased risk of uterine cancer. And there may be some uh, salient benefits to the idea that there may be a decreased risk for some of the uh, mental, for sure, mental health issues as well. That makes sense. Thank you for talking on, on that. Question number 11. Abortion is often discussed and debated in society, but people rarely discuss what's actually involved in abortion procedures. Why might people tend to avoid discussing the details of abortion procedures when it's such an important issue in culture today? I, I think it's because it's, it's absolutely gruesome. Uh, when you look at the idea that you're doing a surgical procedure, even early in 12 or 13 weeks, essentially uh, using a suction procedure in particular or using a curette, you're dismembering a, a, a living human being and it's just, it's just bloody. 
Uh, if you're looking at the later on term, late, late term abortions in particular, where you're dismembering children uh, that are alive, you're pulling arms and legs and crushing skulls. It, it's something that's just really unimaginable to most people. And when you try to talk about it, they absolutely think you're, you're not telling the truth, think you're lying about it, but it, it absolutely is the truth. That's how you have to do this. Um, I think there's also the fact with medical abortions, uh, I've had some people talking to me about that. If you're delivering your you know, 12 or 13 week baby at home in the toilet, and it's still trying to be alive and you're bleeding, that, that's absolutely, again, gruesome for these poor women and it's just traumatic as, as anything they could ever imagine. Also, people want to talk about the possibility of injuries, lacerations, injuries to other organs, uh, infections. There's all these things that a surgical procedure risks that are carried in that and also even in the medical abortions with bleeding and or infection. So people don't want to talk about that because that's not part of the uh, story that wants to be told. Hmm. <clears throat> Question number 12. Would you sketch out for us the different types of surgical and medical abortion? If you look at surgical first, usually in the first trimester, the before 12 weeks, it's a suction DNC. You use a machine that has high power suction. Uh, and you use a curette, you would suction uh, the either living or the, the uh, miscarriage out with the suction, and you'd use a sharp curette to make sure that you uh, were able to get all the placenta out. Uh, these can be quite uh, bloody, depending on how much uh, how far pregnant the patient is and, and how much bleeding there is. Uh, it can cause significant morbidity if, if they really uh, become a, a large amount of bleeding. You can also perforate, you can also have, again, injury to other organs, which is why talking about doing these in a clinic without anesthesia or proper backup is, is in, my, in my opinion, is, is essentially nowhere near the standard of care. Uh, if you're looking at the farther pregnant, say in the second trimester, 14, 15, 16 weeks, now you're actually having to talk about dismembering, uh, pulling the baby apart essentially while alive if you're doing a, a third trimester, second trimester, or even if there's a demise, and you're having to forcibly dilate the cervix open to several centimeters so that you can get the fetal parts out and you have to count parts. Again, it's a um, disturbing thing to have to do, even on a, a baby who's uh, been a stillbirth. Uh, medical abortions, flipping to those, most commonly done with mifeprestone, or mifeprex, excuse me, to cause the death of the fetus and then using the um, mesoprostol to cause it, the expelling of the fetus. Uh, that's usually early, 49 days or less, but has been done up to 10 weeks, which a much, much higher failure rate. Or if they're farther along, uh, after say 22, 23, 24 weeks, and you want to do medical, you can do the um, uh, mesoprostol, which causes uterine contractions and then delivery of the, of the baby. Or uh, you could do later on, even say at 34, 35, 36 weeks, you could do medications like Pitocin and cause contractions and affect delivery that way of the, of the, uh, of the baby. Awesome. What are, what are some of the health risks involved in abortion? Well, I think I categorize in usually four main things that I always think of. There's increased mortality, which is two to three times for a term birth. If you look at overall mortality rates, and that's been documented by the, by particularly the Finnish data, they have a really good database, and they have really good data. So they show that there's a two to three time increased risk for people who undergo abortion versus uh, those who don't. Uh, there's increased breast cancer risk, which every study shows probably about 20 to 25 percent at least risk for breast cancer, um, particularly the early onset breast cancers. Um, the other thing is mental health issues, which are at least 10 percent, probably higher than that, looking at anxiety, depression, uh, people that are abusing drugs and or, or alcohol. So those are all involved in, in abortion as well. And the final one, which has been something I've written about a, a lot, is preterm birth. There's at least a 30 percent increased risk for preterm birth after one abortion, and maybe as high as 60 to 70 after two. And as you go to three and four and five, it goes up, even up over 70 percent increased risk for preterm birth with multiple surgical abortions in particular. What are some of the health benefits involved in abortion? Uh, there are no benefits to abortion, in my opinion, none. Makes sense. How much does a typical abortion cost? And the same question for a typical pregnancy. It would depend on when you do the abortion. The earlier abortions that are done before, say 12 weeks, uh, cost several hundred dollars and it depends on the clinic and what they do and where they're at. They use anesthetics uh, depending on the procedure and how it's done. 
particularly surgical. Even the medical abortions can cost uh, several hundred dollars, depending again on, on how they get the medications and, and follow up and other things. Uh, surgical abortions, particularly that are done after 13 or 14 or 15 weeks, much more complicated, are generally several thousand dollars. And those are supposed to be done in, in places that have resuscitation and actual surgical suites. But again, people say those can be done in an outpatient area, which is to me seems insane. They're, they're extremely dangerous. And then the same question for uh, what's the typical cost for a, uh, a pregnancy? Well, if you, depending on the pregnancy, probably two or $3,000 overall for the overall cost of a pregnancy, generally, for a normal pregnancy, as we pointed out. Um, question 16. From a medical perspective, what are some of the biggest misconceptions people have about abortion? I think the, the biggest thing that's touted about uh, particularly uh, elective abortion is that it's a safe procedure without complications. And as I pointed out, there is a significant impact on the, on the mother. There's impact on her family. Obviously, the, there's 100% mortality for every baby. So to not believe that there's any complications with a major medical procedure that t takes the life of the baby or a surgical procedure is, is simply uh, not true. Makes sense. Question 17. It's been said that most every woman who has an abortion didn't really want an abortion. They just felt like there was no, there's no option for them. In your experience, does that ring true or not? Um, I think my experience has been that every woman I've ever talked to about their abortions didn't want them. And it's very interesting how they would term it. Generally, they'll say that their doctor said they should have an abortion or ought to have an abortion with a medical. I see high-risk patients, so all the patients who have any medical complication of any sort uh, of, have been told they have to have an abortion, the baby will be born damaged, They're the usual litany of things that just simply aren't true. Um, then they talk about their family told them they had to because of the family dynamic, uh, or their partner thought they needed an abortion because they, uh, to, re to stabilize the relationship, or that they couldn't complete their college, or whatever other story is told to somebody about a child. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing on that. Um, number 18, abortion providers have made a strong push to expand access to the abortion pill. Many suggest it's safer than surgical abortion. What is the abortion pill? And is it safer than surgical abortion? The abortion pill is actually pills, uh, generally because the uh, Mifeprex, which is the RU486, it's a progesterone inhibitor, so it blocks progesterone to the placenta. Uh, and so what happens is that means that the baby then dies from lack of progesterone, and then they use uh, the mesoprostol to expel the, the, uh, the fetus who has died from the effects of the, of the other drug. Um, so that's what, the, it's not one but two. Uh, I think the idea that it's safer is really not true. If you look at the data, one, it's flawed because we don't have a lot of good data on the um, actual complications. Uh, the second part of this is that they will talk about failure rates because they, they hide those statistics too. There's a 2% failure rate if you do it at about 10 weeks, which is when it was supposedly approved, but now they're doing it up to um, 10 to 11 or 12 weeks, which is a 7% failure rate. If they fail, they have to be dealt with surgically. If you do it surgically, that increases your risk of preterm birth to by 20 to 30 percent minimum, and maybe as high as 70 or 80 percent if you look at the uh, amount of preterm delivery with it. So it's not really safer than surgical. It's just easier to administer because you can do it online, or you can have people pick it up at the local drugstore, or whatever other way you can do it. It's less effort on the abortionist part. Makes sense. Um, question 19. Elective abortion choice is often promoted as health care for women specifically. In your view, is elective abortion health care? I think if you look at the definition of health care, we're usually using health care to treat a disease. Pregnancy is not a disease. It's a normal function of life, so therefore I have to conclude that abortion is not health care. It's, it's a social uh, 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 solution to a problem, but it's not health care. You're not treating a disease. Makes sense. 
Mario, how are we doing with the time? That's funny. Okay. Um, <coughs> question 20. In your experience, when women seek an abortion, how well informed are they about what's involved in the abortion procedure and what effects it may have on them overall? Uh, I think most women aren't really well informed. I think that they don't understand, as we've talked about preterm birth, we've talked about breast cancer, we've talked about the psychological effects, we've talked about uh, the mortality effects. None of that's really shared for the most part. And I don't think many women are ready or understand what's going to happen, particularly in a surgical abortion, or if they have a medical abortion, they're going to actually deliver their baby at home with no one there. And that can be very disturbing for them. And then lastly, is there anything else you'd like to add that we didn't ask you about when it comes to this topic of abortion in the, in the medical, with your medical experience? Well, since I'm sort of, I said, one of the pioneers in perinatal hospice or hospice care, palliative care, I would like to uh, encourage any woman who has a baby with an adverse diagnosis, anencephaly or anything of that nature, that they would uh, be informed about perinatal hospice and that they could find that at uh, perinatalhospice.org. They could find a program or a physician or someone who would be willing to help them with that because those those children deserve that compassion and that care, and the outcomes are better. Um, and then lastly, would you define what perinatal hospice is? Uh, perinatal hospice is the uh, placing the continuum of care for end-of-life care before the baby's born, while inside in utero, and helping the family deal with the inevitable loss of their child after birth, however long that might be, a few minutes, a few hours, a few days. Awesome. Um, all right, thank you so much. I appreciate welcome. your time. Sure. Thank you, Byron. Thank it's my you. pleasure. You're welcome. Great. Rise and build.